Star Trek popularized the term warp speed, but aerospace engineers and physicists from around the world are trying to turn science fiction into science fact. Let's see what she's got. Dr. Chance Glenn, Vice President for Academic Affairs at University of Houston, Victoria, joins me to discuss his new warp drive theory and how it differs from other approaches and how many materials could be used in his design. Join us as we get Rebelliously Curious. Dr. Glenn Chance, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. We've had other warp drive conversations before with Dr. Mm -hmm. Sunny Harold White. So I'm very excited to speak with you, uh, adding on to our warp drive edition and uh -huh. interviews for our podcast. So welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And, and call me Chance. Chance is my first name. Glenn's my last name. People always get it all mixed up. Matter of fact, Michael's my middle name. So I've got three first names, but uh, call me Chance. Um, yeah, this is this is really neat. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in all of this for a lot of reasons, um, you know, in, into science and technology to begin with. Uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan. So clearly, uh, being able to do anything in this space is just a, a, a big, a big thrill for me. Oh, I can imagine. And it's so exciting. It's like, it's futurism at its yeah. best. Can you yeah. tell me then let's just start off by, by how you ended up getting into warp drive technology yeah. and warp yeah. drive research and development? Well, you know, all right, let's talk about what warp and warp drive means. Yeah, for well, sure. Warp drive means, at least in our terms. Now, what Star Trek was trying to do is might be different, but what what this means is that space time, as Einstein believed, is you know um, of something that is malleable, something that can be uh, uh, deformed, if you will, by uh, heavy or uh, uh, very dense mass objects, for example, or energy. Because the, the thing that made Einstein's E equals MC squared equation famous is that it's an equivalence between mass and energy. So a very heavy planet can warp space time, which makes us fall to it. That's what gravity is. Or a lot of energy can warp space time. So um, that's that's the idea. So warping space time is one thing. Then, as it turns out, this guy uh, uh, named uh, Alcubierre, Miguel Alcubierre, proposed a set of equations to say that if you deform warped space, or, or if you deform space time in a certain way, you can move through. Uh, uh, you can change your position. Let's just say that. And you're really not changing your position. You're moving space time around you. That was the idea. So he developed this set of equations. It's all fine and good. But the problem is that it takes an enormous amount of energy. And the way he developed the, uh, the, the, the equations based off of Einstein's was that it was going to take this negative energy, which nobody really understands what it is. So. Just to summarize, it's a way to move around by selectively deforming space time in front and behind you in order to do that. Kind of like a wave on a, on a, a ship on an ocean. It's a great analogy. It's a great yeah. uh, visual too. So yes. compared well, to so a career, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go for it, go for it. Well, you, you asked me kind of what, what how I got involved in it and really what my claim to this piece of it is. So let's talk about this negative energy density that was required. Um, it, it's large, it's negative. What does negative energy mean? Well, I, I come from, I'm an electrical engineer. I come from a 
uh, electromagnetics and RF background. And my understanding of things, number one, was that uh, most mathematicians would know that if you square a complex number, you'll get a negative number. I mean, that's how you get a complex number by taking two uh, you know, uh, negative numbers or, or what's the square root of a negative number. So when you square it, you get a negative number. So I said, all right, instead of this shaping function just being a regular function, what if we made it complex? Did that, and now the outcome of the energy changed. So mathematically, it made sense. I did some models, and that was the basis of the uh, paper I wrote. Uh, to simulate that with a mathematical model to show that now the energy density was instead of it pointing down as negative, it pointed up now as positive. So that's one step. But what does that actually, what could you actually do with it? Well, now with the RF background, I know that dielectrics have the capability of having a complex uh, dielectric constant. So now we're talking about something real that could be used to actually do something like this in a in an experiment to show that perhaps you know you could do something. Now you're, we're talking about moving ships around is one thing, but what I'm really wanted to do, and here's here's the crux of what I want to accomplish. I want to do a, an experiment to show that you can actually indeed distort space-time with a process and show that you can make perhaps at a microscopic or nanoscopic level distort space-time as a beginning and get some measures about how much power it might take to do so. And then if you do that, you could scale it perhaps. So that, that's the initial basis. So exciting. And I have so many questions about sure. looking at the, yeah. And I'll, I'll get to them at one point too, talking about like kind of micro to, to, to anything larger, but, mm. and to, to creating something that would be, you know, a warp bubble around a craft. But first mm. I'd like to know your theory compared to the Kubrayer's theory and everybody else's theories around warp drive. How is your, yeah. dif how is yours different compared to like sunny Harold white and limitless space and the Kubrayer? I'm always, hopefully I'm always saying that right. The yeah, Kubrayer yeah, drive theory. There yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> got all got to look, got to love all the science names, but how is yours know. very fundamental? And I know you just kind of said that, but can you break it down for somebody so they can know kind of the exact differences so that they could cool. be like, Oh, if they're following warp drive theory or they're following sunny whites theories, how is yours different? And then how has it become alive and practical then? Hmm. And you know, the, the, that, what you just asked is a great question because it, that alive and practical part, is what is that's the that's the most important part because you can right. talk about theories and mathematics all the time where does it actually become practical and 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 as you know we've had recent news about fusion uh reactions that's coming out of uh you know a team so you know these things are starting to be talked about in 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 real and practical terms as as you just stated now so Miguel Cubieri, he's he's the one who just he proposed a metric, and the metric it basically is a something describing physical locations in space. And he said if you have this metric, then this will show how you can move around in space by selectively altering space time. That's what his metric is. And it became a foundation for a lot of different things. Sonny White is one. Um, Eric Lentz is another. Um, uh, I, there's a couple others. In, and, and actually, DARPA has looked at this as well. It's papers right. out that they've produced. Now, um, so what they've said is that, okay, given that metric and given the shaping function that he proposes in this metric, here's what what Sonny White did was take the energy requirements and reduce it down to something more manageable. Because at first it was going to take more energy than the entire universe could could produce and be negative. 
then Sonny White began to manipulate uh, the, the, the geometries of the warp bubble such that you reduce the energy. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's one thing that he's now, he's also now starting looking at quantum effects and cashmere effects, which is a completely different phenomenon, uh, and see how that interplays perhaps with space time, uh, altering and stuff. So that's, that's the way he's chasing. So specifically for me, I'm saying I found a way to turn this negative energy requirement into a positive energy requirement, which is now practical and realizable. Here's another thing about the equations. They're large because there's a velocity term in it and it's squared. The velocity is, okay, how fast do you want this vessel to go? Well, everybody pops in, you know, I want to go 10 times the speed of light. I want to go this, you know, this enormous speeds into the equations. And that's why the energy is so big. But, and and the this energy density term is directly proportional to the velocity squared. So if you don't need to go that fast, for example, if I'm in a, in a laboratory, I don't want to see a bubble zipping by at, 10 times the speed of light. It's not even practical. You never see it, whatever, right? So I don't need the velocity to be high. I just want to show that I can warp space time. So now I actually found a dielectric material that has the, the proper uh, complex dielectric constant. So now I've designed a, a chamber if you will, with this material inside of it. And that's what I'm going to pump with uh, RF, uh, a, a electromagnetic uh, frequency, and to see whether I can induce enough energy in there to form a very small warp bubble. That's the, that's the, the goal I have. And if you can do that at a very small level with, the, with enough power, then you could begin to scale it to say, all right, if I want a bigger one, this is how much more power I need and so on and so forth. Um, are you so working on a quantum that, level too? Is that what is, or are you, cause I know other scientists are working on quantum levels. Are you still, uh, is that still no, quantum based? No, it's not. Okay. It's a, uh, it's a, a macroscopic level. Uh, as far as you know, the 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 practical nature. What the, the right. experiment I'm going to conduct is a interferometer experiment where you have two lasers, and I mean, where you have a laser that interferes with itself, and without anything in between, you'll see these fringe patterns, and they'll all be nice rings of of uh, interference fringes. But then, what I want to do, I put my device in between one of the beams. And then turn it on, pump it with the uh, pulsed RF, and now I'm I'm looking for changes in those fringes. Now the fringes uh, can be measured in distances in in nanometers, so really really small, ten to the minus nine meters, uh, because it's on the order of the wavelength of the light that you're using. So that allows you to do really sensitive measurements. And that's what they use to measure gravitational waves now. They use a Michelson inter interferometer. That's the experiment I'm, I'm conducting uh, in order to determine whether or not at a small level that this process. And so this chamber will be filled with this dielectric material but it has a way that the, the laser beam would go right through the middle of the chamber. And if there is any distortion going on of, of space time inside of it, you'll see the fringes react. Interesting. So right. then, yeah, then on a metric level, is this faster than light or sublight? It depends on what you want to do. Now, you know, as I said, if, the shaping function determines how fast you go. That's that's the really the practical part. The shaping function it says, okay, I want to 
I want to squeeze space time in front of my vest. All right, let me use a practical example. I'm going to, I'm going to. Yeah, that was, uh, practical Whoa. examples are the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing better than this, right? <laughs> There's my, now, you know, I don't know who was working on the, I'm going I'm to put it backdrop to here. So now you can see the blackness of it. I don't know who is working on the technical um, uh, consulting for Star Trek. I know they have a lot of NASA scientists, but the idea, as they describe it, is that these nacelles warp space time. It's kind of skating on distorted space time. But if you, if you, what what uh, Al Cubieri's equations are saying that in the front of the ship, if you squeeze space time in the front and in the back you expand it then you can make this go forward right and the intensity level that you do it impacts the speed or you can call it warp factor if you want right <laughs> warp um, factor one and i think these are warp factor yeah, five yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so you could you could essentially you could go faster than light and the beautiful part about it is that in reality, this ship is not moving. It's space time around it that's moving and going past it. And so ultimately you get to your destination. Wait, I got another practical. <laughs> you you eventually <laughs> get <laughs> so think about it. the ship is staying still. Every everything is moving to it. Yeah, it's great. So, it's a, it's a great. I love the props too. Well, the people inside the ship are not experiencing inertia. They're not experiencing time uh, dilation, which if you did approach anywhere near the speed of light, you would go through all those different issues. Right. Uh, you would. You would. You could go somewhere and come back, and everybody else is like a hundred years older. <laughs> you know right let alone like being you know traveling at the speed of light you'd be ripped apart if if you don't yeah, have any warp yeah, technology yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but you're not so you're not really moving so that's why you can violate the not faster than going faster than speed of light rule because you're not moving space time is moving around you and, and but you're you're but you're facilitating the movement of space time with the energy that is being induced inside of whatever you know material now i actually i do have a can a you break down the concept problem. of material too for me because when people think material they're going to think like some people will think physical material so what does yeah. what does material yeah, consist I, of yeah i will hold on, hold on. okay <laughs> all right so First of all, this this is my guy is uh Spock. That's my He's favorite character of all time in anything, any anything. Uh, but certainly in the old series, that was my guy. So I patterned myself after him. But now here's a pretty close example of what say uh, this chamber might look like. Okay, so. So inside of this would I would put this material, which really is, right now is a liquid. There's a liquid called uh, ethylene glycol, which is essentially a um, uh, antifreeze type material. But it has a complex dielectric constant. You can look it up. Um, and then what would happen is you can see down the middle there would be an opening, but the material, the liquid would stay inside, but you'd have the opening such that there's just a plug. But the the laser beam, let me take this off like this, because this isn't the actual chamber, but it looks something like that. The laser beam would shine right through the middle of it. And you would pump the energy through a connector on the side into the chamber and hit it with the as high a power as you can stand without blowing the thing up. And as that beam goes through, if the energy uh, causes 
space time in that area to be distorted, then the laser beam will be altered. So is it a reactor? <laughs> no, no, okay. it's not. It's not. It's just um it's just uh, a chamber that is uh is an RF chamber. Uh mm -hmm. it is a, a resonant cavity. Some some of our RF engineers will, will know about that. Um it's a resonant cavity at, at the right frequency given a, the material that's inside, and you pump it. And if you pump it hard enough, my theory is that you will distort space-time at the center. And if you distort space-time at the center, then the laser beam that's passing through will be altered. And if it's altered, then the interference fringes will, will show it. And that's, that's the experiment that I want to conduct. That's amazing. So you also spoke about pulsing. Does pulsing, yeah. what what does that have to do with, again, if it's for traveling, if it, is it, um, is it, is there something that you're saving on energy is what's yeah. the pulse have anything to do? Yeah. These are, these are great questions. Um, um, there's two reasons why I want to pulse the energy. Number one, there's a lot of, this is a very sensitive experiment. There's a lot of, uh, distortions that could impact the measurement just even vibrations in the room or some or a train moving down a track 10 miles away could get picked up very small alterations you want to be able to remove um interference and know that it's what you're doing that's causing the distortions so if i pulse it at the right rate uh, or with the right shape pattern, I pulse the RF, then I know, and I see the interference fringes changing at the same rate with the pulses, I know that I'm doing it and not something else. That's one of the reasons. So I can basically tag the variations according to what I want to do as opposed to something outside affecting it so, so you, you have more off. control over it yeah yeah you have more control and you can recognize your your influence rather than just some other extraneous influence you know because i don't want to go run out there i did it i did it i did it i see the <laughs> i see the fringes changing and turns out oh no that was just uh, somebody was coming up the stairs and they were shaking <laughs> you know um, but there, there is so it's because it's a very sensitive measurement, very sensitive. So that's number one. Then, then you alluded to something yourself when you said, uh, you know, it's energy savings. I mean, because think about it if you just turn something on and leave it on, the energy is, you know, of uh, the power times the time. Um, but if you pulse it you know, you turn it off, you turn it on, you're saving a lot of energy by, by doing that. If you're talking about moving, perhaps if you just are bumping something like you're bumping it in the, in the water, you can, you can still move. Right. Um, but it's, you know, you're, it's an accumulation of those pulses as opposed to um, all on at one time. So what are the limitations then with this type of work and research that you're doing? There has to be a few, I would imagine, and they might be different limitations than other people doing, you know, research and development too on warp drive technology. Well, I think the biggest limitation or let's just call it challenge is um, uh, going to be the, the, the energy levels required and knowing what they are, because, you know, again, it may not work at all. Right. Um, and how do we know when we have enough power that it's going to work or not work? Uh, number two, do you, you know, you, you pump too much power into the chamber. You just essentially explode the chamber and, <laughs> excuse me, um, you know, uh, you just explode the chamber and that's, that's where you are. So your, your, your experiment is done. So there's, there's power limitations, uh, you know, then the sensitivity and making sure you have some accurate measurements. 
Now, one of the things I'm I'm taking now as the next step is is a, a really detailed simulation of the chamber in a electromagnetics uh, um, um, uh, forward um, of, of uh, element. Um, what am I thinking of? The um, I, I I'll think of it in a second. It's okay. Come back yeah. to it, but um, um there's some analysis to use to do like electromagnetics and heat and all that stuff in an actual uh design of something that may look like this or whatever the chamber needs to really be we can simulate it pretty pretty detailed first and see what the you know i want to see where the fields form um how um intense are they are there any limitations in getting the and actually getting the power into the chamber itself before I build it and set up the experiment and test it? We can do that, and I'm working on that now. That's amazing. Now, a uh, finite finite element analysis. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, so a finite element analysis tool is a tool called Comsol that I'm using to simulate the chamber, the energy inside, and to see what the fields will look like. Amazing. Now, has anybody else like Sunny, Harold White, or anyone else doing warp drive technology, you know, within the science community or outside that have just of interest of it, have they said any comments on your recent paper? And oh, yeah. have they had any yeah. like critiques in, in what they might be? Because everyone's theories are different, and obviously you guys could work together potentially in the future too. There's a lot of room for collaboration, I I would think. Oh yeah, no matter of fact, I'm collaborating with Sonny. He's, we're we're good awesome. friends, and uh, he's actually offered me to utilize some of his lab space to to, to work out the experiments. He he knows a bit, lot about interferometry work, uh, so we we he's been gracious, and I'm taking him up on it. So so that's really really cool. Um, I've, I've talked to others, uh, lens. There's a, there's also a gentleman I think you had on, his name is, uh, uh, Greg, Greg Hodgkin. Uh, he's, he's looking at now, this is where it gets interesting how these things converge. As, as we mentioned earlier, uh, they're talking about fusion. Uh, he has a concept where you utilize a very small microscopic nanoscopic warp bubble to contain a and to hold together a fusion reaction and therefore make it more stable and this could actually help solve the issue that because right now the people uh that have done this uh, in the news they can only sustain it for five seconds so you know if something like this could be done and that's what he's looking at in here and he's working to kind of create this consortium of people working so for example i would be working because i've signed the mou with them uh if if I, i'm working on this microscopic warp bubble side um so think about it if, if it did help enable a fusion reaction then you use that power you create to build a, to create an even bigger warp bubble which allows you to stabilize even greater fusion reaction which is more power and now you can create a bigger bubble now you begin to enable perhaps the uh ability to create a bubble big enough to encase a ship it's amazing it's so exciting well, yeah, these are these are the kind of things that are go coming right out of the pages of science fiction into reality and um you know, I've always wanted to, from a young kid, to be involved in stuff like this. And that was with NASA. I, I do work with SpaceX right now. Uh, I've worked with NASA before. Uh, but now to work on something that's cutting edge that perhaps no one else has ever done. So so you asked me whether uh, other, you know, others had comments. And so, so White has talked about... Um, he he wants to see what this experiment he he believes is there's a potential there. He's talked about exotic matter, but you know nobody really knows what that is, you know, and dark matter, dark energy, all this, you know, to right. But nobody knows what it is. Uh, Have you looked I into believe, metamaterials as well? Ah, 
that's an excellent for that. That is a way that I'm looking to implement this as well, is through metamaterials. That's that's a great observation. Um, because metamaterials can allow you to create all kinds of different uh material effects. Now, like I said, the 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 initial substance I'm looking at is a liquid. So I would this would actually be a liquid filled chamber, might which might have its own challenges. But if this was a metal material, uh, which is not liquid, but it can be made up of a lot of different shapes and or geometric patterns and orientation to give you the same kind of effects. Now, um, you know, we're talking about a completely different uh, type of maybe even more realizable geometry. So, so would the craft be made of metamaterials and the bubble as well? Could it all be metamaterial? Well, I think the, the let's call them the, whether it's the nacelles or whatever is enabling the, the uh, space warp type of action, that part would be made out of metamaterial. Perhaps not the whole craft, but just the part that you need to the drive unit or the 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 shell. I don't know if, if uh, you said you've talked with, with Dr. White. Uh, I have, so I'm yeah. sure you've seen the video that he's produced. Yes, I've and seen. Um, we did, actually did an interview on that. And that um, that uh, ship, which which actually is officially in what, the Star Trek line now, uh, but that ship, you know, has the rings around it. Right. So in his his ship, his version, he says, oh, that's filled with some exotic matter. Well, I believe that you end up filling it with the material I'm talking about. But again, I got to show it. And so that's what I'm going to try to do through this experiment. So how close are we to first you doing this experiment? And then after this experiment, how close would it be for this actually becoming plausible and in real life? Like, I know that's a really hard question to answer yeah. because we really don't know but if you yeah. had to put a number out there how quick would you like to see it and when do you think it would be in in actual practicality well one of the things that you know if you take a if you if you can take a look at a the, the, a curve showing how quickly technology advancements have escalated exponentially so you know there were times when you have a concept and it takes you 50 years to see it um, become practical. Then it started getting got cut down to 25 years, not 10 years. And now you have, because of our tools, because of our knowledge, because of our connectivity, because of all these different things, you see the, the time between uh, theory and practice getting shorter and shorter. Now, with all that said, um, we're actually at a point where we're trying to practically show an experiment or experimentally show the verification of theoretical equations. Um, for example, if I would, and I'm going to, you know, be conducting this experiment in the next, in the coming year, in the next couple of months. If you hear loud Eureka, <laughs> you know, come out from somewhere in the Houston, Texas area. Um, I would think that um, the impact that would have to say that there's a practical, verifiable, because, you know, all the detractors are going to come out and say, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this. But if you can repeat the experiment, you show that you can do it. Um, then it's about scaling uh, the power levels. And that's when the kind of people, you know, uh, who's doing these ultra powerful lasers to to do a uh, 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 fusion react, that's when they start getting involved. And um, I think it could be, you know, a decade after before you start seeing people trying to uh, move things around and actually make things go by warping space time. But that's, again, that's my uh, prediction. Uh, don't 
hold me to it specifically but there's a lot of people that would be very very interested in this if it was shown to be practical at all oh for sure and so exciting I have to ask you then, because there is the new plasma propulsion discovery that was just announced this past Tuesday. This this will obviously air later, but it just actually was announced yesterday. How does this relate into your work moving forward? And, and can you benefit from this? Um, only if there, you know, the impact on the energy levels are, and allows more practical uses of or practical ways to manipulate energy i don't i don't know enough about it to just say that yes we can use this this and this my approach is an rf chamber pumping in uh, uh pumping an rf a, a chamber with rf in order to produce an effect uh if there, that effect is realized there's a number of ways you could introduce the energy. It doesn't have to be RF. It could be something else. It could be a laser. Uh, it could be heat. It could be something else, right? Uh, and that's where now the engineering and the actual practical application starts to happen. And um, I'm not certain if that's the way or is there something else uh, that would make it more uh, realizable but if you had to put out a cost of how much mm. this would <laughs> this would take to build even for your experiment you obviously don't oh. have to tell me what that cost is but then into yeah. something that's larger like what are the numbers that we're looking at here no 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 i, I i'll tell you the cost that we're looking at uh because I'm, I'm trying to raise it uh i'm gonna move forward with it one way or another but i'm you know we're seeking out some grants and some other sources of support to do it um but i'm right now i'm looking at about a two million dollar effort over uh, a year's time to conduct the experiment uh, that's actually not bad it's not uh yeah. it's not and like i said i mean some of the stuff and, and that's really like personnel and time and stuff like that it's not so much materials because materials and all that are are pretty pretty inexpensive the machining needed for you know now if want to do more right. yeah it's 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 there's things that are out there but um but you need people doing stuff and innovating and coming okay wait a minute this didn't work but let's try this and you know that kind of stuff um that is something that is is where the costs come in and i like to have a team of people working with me to help me make it happen uh because i want to have a parallel venture of uh, of doing a simulation, then start the interferometer setup and, and experiments, uh, then de uh, designing the different chambers and, and then doing initial tests, then doing some metamaterial designs and, 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 and then do with different frequencies and different pulse strengths and, you know, just different things like that. And then you have to simulate the results and determine what has actually happened and everything else so you know it takes people and, and i want to build that team uh and you need uh you know money to do it but i'm not waiting for anything because there's certain things i can do now and i'm already starting to do so exciting and Chance, thank you so much. That is our time. Uh, no. I just want to say that when you are able to tell or show media and people publicly any form of experiment, call me. I will be on the next flight out to Houston or anywhere <laughs> that you possibly are. All right. Just to All see right. a warp bubble in real life. So oh, wow. just to remember, I'll I'll be there. I'd get my own ticket and fly out. Not even oh, on yeah. the debrief. You'll be in a long line. You'll be in a <laughs> long line because more people want to see that. Uh, well, hopefully like Christopher it. Plain and myself and MJ Benias, I know they're writing this article as well, and I'm doing the video interview. So oh, yeah, hopefully yeah. all of our team will, will fly out together and we can see a real warp bubble in real life. That would just be yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Well, that would be awesome. Uh, and, and that's what we're working towards. We, it's either going to work or it's not. That's that's one thing I can say for certain. <laughs> well, we're we're crossing our fingers. It, it works. That's for sure. And as I tell all my guests, thank you so much, Chance, for being rebelliously curious with me today. Thank you.